Hi, everybody. Welcome. We have a really cool conversation today. There is a new book called March On, which was written and illustrated by sisters Lucy and Grace Lang. It celebrates the history of Americans' women's suffrage and the history of this and the iconic 1915 New York City Women's March as told in rhyme. It is a beautiful book. It is called March On, and it is a great pleasure to welcome the author and illustrators to the program. Hello, how are you? I'm Paul Grando from the New York State Writers Institute. Hello, Paul, how are you? We're doing good. This is a, this is a really a pleasure to, uh, to talk with the Lang sisters. Lucy Lang and Grace Lang, thank you very much for being with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Paul, for bringing us all together. We're honored to have this conversation with your listeners and tell you more about our book, March On, that we're excited is helping to elevate this important centennial this year. Okay, so which one's the writer, which one's the illustrator? How does that work? Well, I'm the writer officially, but I have to admit that the writing went through a number of, of revisions, so it certainly was vetted heavily by my sister, the illustrator, and also we are fortunate that uh, one of our sisters-in-law um, is a, an early child educator who helped us think through some of the language and also put together the discussion questions that are available on our website, which is marchonny.com, because really what we intended for this book to do was to be the beginning of a conversation for young children about the merits of activism, of marching, and of voting. And so after I um, approached Grace about the idea of doing a, a book together, after a long time of wondering whether there might be a way for us to collaborate around our two areas of expertise, mine being law and hers being fine arts, um, I came to her with the idea and she has been the amazing creative vision who really gave life to the words, the ideas, and the history in a way that um, we feel is uniquely accessible to young children. Great. Um, I was interested in, in your description about the motivation for the book. It, were you at the Women's March in Washington? Because it seemed like you were, that that might have spurred some of this uh, uh, activism feeling that's behind the book and, and, and sort of women's empowerment in a way. I and we have been in a number of women's marches. I was not at the, the particular one immediately after the inauguration or the day of the inauguration, but it was in part in response to all of the imagery in popular press that we started to realize that there was really a need for language around what was happening for children. Yeah, we noticed like, um, you know, a lot of friends and friends of friends posting uh, photos of themselves at marches with their kids. And so we, we started thinking about, well, how are they explaining these big topics to their kids if they're coming to these marches and you know reading these signs and stuff so that was part of the motivation as well um yeah start like my sister said just you know starting conversations so what brought you to 1915 i mean obviously it could have been because of what paul just mentioned it could have been more contemporary but you you focused in on on 1915. the idea was to celebrate the history of suffrage uh, because of the upcoming centennial. And when we started to do some research, it became really clear how core the 1915 march was to moving that cause forward. And of course, as New Yorkers, that is, um, it really resonates for us that New York would be the hub of this important feminist activism. And many of the images that Americans associate with suffrage around that period really date to the 1915 March. And I think from an artist's perspective, um, when we started looking at them together, Grace really saw potential in those, in those works. Yeah, there's actually um, a few images in the book that are really directly referencing um, photographs from those from the 1915 March and um, I think in 1913 March as well, and um, suffrage posters. I looked at a lot of that kind of stuff. So there was a lot of time spent in the beginning just um, researching, you know, kind of costumes, hairstyles, hats, um, you know, what the women marching actually might have looked like. So that was a really fun process for me. Right. We also did a, a visit along with our mom to the Museum of the City of New York where there was an exhibition on the history of suffrage. And so we had the opportunity to look at some 
archival images that are less known to the public and to view some primary sources at the Museum of the City of New York that further helped inspire it. At the time, we were thinking of this in some ways as a kind of a love letter to the women in our family. And we had come up with the idea of doing it and decided not to tell our mom because we wanted to surprise her with this book once we put it together. Um, and so we were all together at the museum and Grace and I were sort of secretly looking at pictures together and pointing things out, thinking, oh, we can use that detail. Oh, look at that picture on the horse. And then my mom would come over and we would sort of say, oh, nothing, it's nothing. <laughs> um, but it ended up being a kind of fun project that we, once we did present her with an early draft um, and I went and talked about sharing it with my sisters-in-law and our aunt who is a remarkable um, lawyer who's been a real inspiration to both of us, it became uh, something that, that a lot of people kind of weighed in on. So it is not just that we're proud of the product, but also that we're really proud of the process that a lot of, of women with very different perspectives and from different generations of activism all weighed in. And it was really critically important too that from the very early stages we started reading it aloud and showing the pictures to my children who are now four and six to see what resonated with them. Did, did you want that to be the, 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 the age, the sweet spot, if you will, of, of what you were looking for, young kids? It's really written for, for children between sort of two and seven or thereabouts. Yeah. And so that, I assume, is for you, was what made rhyme so appealing. It's an interesting thing because I have started to realize really just in the past few days how much everyone in our family rhymes almost by accident. <laughs> our aunt, who I just mentioned, <laughs> he had a piece in the New York Times two days ago that in the Corona uh, poetry section where she had written a, a piece of verse about coronavirus. Our father has a uh, has published a pretty extensive piece of historical poetry as part of a one-man show that he developed. He's also working on some uh, upcoming poetry. So I think that we all have kind of an inclination towards the sound of poetry, but in particular for young children, I have found that it makes remembering things and learning easier. So that was part of it, but it was always a poetic book in our minds, I think. Um, I love the uh, the intergenerational aspect of the book, and also that you you take note of the, the the strong, independent, brilliant women in your family tree: mothers, grandmothers, aunts. But tell me about your situation in quarantine now. You you have three generations there. It sounds like a, a a rhyming, a wild, fun time. Who who all is there in in Kinderhook? How many kids? How many adults and grandparents and everything? Well, we are really fortunate to be talking about this now in retrospect, because when quarantine started, um, all the adults in the house were varying degrees of ill. And at the time, we didn't really know that it was uh, COVID-19, but have of course subsequently been tested and, and realized that we were really lucky that it made the rounds of the house, but that everyone um, was able to stay home and be managed safely at home, and ultimately that we're all healthy now. So. We now are our, our parents, um, myself and my partner and our two children, and Grace and her partner live uh, just down the road. So they are kind of, they've been co-quarantined with us. So we have two generations, but our brothers who are on the West Coast, we of course zoom in um, whenever we can. So we, it's three generations. Three generations. Yeah. Three generations, <laughs> that's right. Um, <laughs> And, and it, there's a lot of rhyming. There's a lot of reading um, aloud. Reading a aloud. lot of reading aloud. Yeah. Um, a, lot of, a lot of eating. Do you, do you lead art projects? Uh, yes, I do. We've set up the basement um, into just a really awesome art space where we have clay paint, collage, blocks, tons of stuff. Um, and now that it's nice out, we're going to start doing some outside art projects, I think. Maybe get even messier. I'm excited. <laughs> uh, 
it's perfect. It's not good until it's messy. Exactly, exactly. So right. for young listeners, there are coloring pages available on our website, on the resources page. And we're thrilled to see the work that our friends, kids, and, and kids all over the place are doing, coloring in some of these images that are Grace's artistic take on the iconic images. So please, folks, feel free to um, print out the pages, color them in, post them, send them to us, tag us. Uh, it's really exciting to see kids interpreting those images in their own ways. So Grace, let me ask you two questions uh, about the, the, art, the art, the artistic process here. Uh, one, as you mentioned earlier, about the posters having some influence. Talk a little bit about the posters of, of the time, what they were like, and, and how they influenced you. Um, I mean, in, certain, in some ways, I think they're not so different from modern activist, activist posters. You know, usually a slogan, and often it was just votes for women, um, or, you know, suffrage, equality. Um, really bold words and um, most I think most of the ones women were actually holding as they marched were just words but then the um, the posters made for the marches like to advertise people to come right. to the march were much more illustrative um, and there were some that you know really I remember one in particular had you know an actual parade of women just really beautifully illustrated in sort of the old Gibson girl kind of style um, so that was interesting to think about as well, where it's like you have the posters to get the people to the event, and then they themselves are also making posters that are part of the event. And it was the, that kind of imagery that really um, inspired the, the kind of urgency that I felt for us to tell this story and to get it out this year. The notion that in 1915, you could hang posters in New York City and there would be a five mile parade down Fifth Avenue, that it would be the largest march in New York City's history to date. That was incredibly powerful to me and something I thought, my children should know that. You know, they should mm. know that when they go vote, which they do every time we vote in every single primary, you know, um, on our way to take them to school, they should know that this is a hard won right, that this required a lot of people uh, taking to the streets to get it done. So. Um, the the posters, the slogans, the imagery all um, helped really underscore to us the importance of getting this story out there and getting it out there now because of the centennial and also because of the upcoming elections. Right. Yeah. Now, one other art question. I'm hoping, Lisa, you could help me out here. There's a there's a a great um, illustration of sort of the group a, a group of women. Can you open up to that? And then I have a specific. There, yeah, there you go. This is there a, you go. Um, the Grace can describe a little bit that is based on more contemporary marches. Now, I'm, I'm fascinated by this, Grace, because I have to say it's beautiful. It's striking. Uh, tell me about the cheeks. Thank you. <laughs> the cheeks. You, you have great cheeks and in, in, oh, illustrated you. there. Um, honestly, a lot of the time, um, when I am working, you know, I, I had created a set color palette and sometimes, um, when it comes to color distribution, I'm like, oh, but I need like a little bit of pink there to even out the pink that's over there. So cheeks and like eye makeup and lipstick are really good for that purpose to just get a little <laughs> pop of a color that's missing, sort of even things out. Um, so that's, that's sort of, yeah, why the cheeks are. And I just thought it was also a bit more, you know, kid-friendly, the rosy cheeks. It sure. looks fun. It looks friendly. Uh -huh. what, is it, what is it like to set up that color palette? What is that? Because that sort of sets the, the tone, yeah. doesn't it? I mean, literally. Yeah, I mean, and I, I, I have always struggled a little with color because I love it so much that it's hard for me to, um, you know, set down a palette. But so these um, illustrations were done... Uh, by hand with ink, the black line was, and then they were scanned. And after I did that, I got an iPad, which makes digital work really, really easy. And you can actually just put a scan in and go behind the ink work with um, different digital brushes and colors. So that made it really easy to just try a bunch of different things. I took one image and did maybe five different versions with different palettes and different brushes for the color and showed them to my sister and to my roommate and a couple friends and talked about it. And then 
that's sort of how we, we settled on it. Um, I knew I wanted to use this coral color because I was just seeing it a, a lot everywhere. And I didn't want to do bright, bright pink that is sometimes associated with women's marches, even though it's a cool color. It's just, I think coral is a little funkier. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of trial and error with the color. And then once I found something I liked, I was like, don't mess with it. You cannot add any more colors. Just, just go and do it. I also wanted to ask you about your, your influences because it's a very unique style. To me, it almost seems like a, a woodcut kind of old time, old fashioned blend, but also like anime and, and the exaggerated eyes, almost like um, very hip, the Hello Kitty or, or, or some mm -hmm. kind of uh, um, very modern kind of take. But can you describe your influences on, on, on the style for this book? Sure. Um, I feel like, I mean, my influences come from everywhere and it's, I feel like I can't even name them all because you don't even realize when you're being influenced, but you're absolutely right that anime has had an influence on my art for sure. Um, I actually was just looking at a journal from when I was 10 and I started writing about how I was mastering new drawing techniques because of um, anime. <laughs> so um, it's been something I like for a long time. I just, I love drawing eyes. I think most artists feel that way. So it made complete sense for eyes to just be really big on people's faces when I'm drawing. <laughs> um, and in terms of the woodcut thing, yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't do woodcut. I tried it a little in college and um, didn't, I just didn't, wasn't very good at it. But I've always really liked that look. Um, I love like you know, MUCA and old old school uh, lithography and printmaking. So um, this was an opportunity to sort of look at it like it was printmaking because I just gave myself a, a very specific palette and didn't want to, if I was painting, there might be like 12 shades of the same color, you know, but here I really tried to limit myself um, as if it was going to be printed the way an old poster would have been printed where they're like, we have six colors, that's all you can use, you know? Right. Um, even though it's not the case with digital, I sort of was imagining it that way. I also, uh, one other question, as, as sisters working on this collaboratively, I'm sure there's no sibling rivalry in your growing up or anything, I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume, but I, I did see you have like nine years in between, you've got a couple brothers in between. Were you close or, or not so much because of the span of years and did this bring you closer, this whole process? From my perspective, aging has brought us closer. A nine-year difference is huge when you are one and, and 10. And of course, it's, it's far less when you are 30 and 39. Um, we also have the good fortune of having a really close-knit intergenerational family. So um, I think we had this sort of precedent of having closeness. Um, I think that the fact that we had a project to work on together was a great conduit for our, our closeness. Although I think that it was, it, it was continuing to evolve in, in really beautiful ways already. And part of that, I credit my children for, who have been um, a great kind of glue to our family. And it's been never more apparent than, than during COVID when um, they provide a really welcome source of joy and amusement in the face of really bleak news. Is that there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also um, doing this project helped me realize all, it's all the possible ways in which we could collaborate. For a long time, I think I just really saw her career as so separate from mine. You know, like there was just no possible way there could be overlap. Even though she's um, a big advocate for the arts and like interested in art, I, I didn't see how there could ever be um, a way for us to merge our interests. And now it, um, I don't know, I feel like this is a catalyst for a lot of future things, maybe not even just with her, but with other people working in fields that I used to see as very, very separate from the arts. Now, I really believe as a person who has spent my adult life working in criminal justice in the arts ability to impact society and in the form of policy change and um, changing hearts and minds and all of that. So a lot of my day job now working on criminal justice reform is about using um, unconventional ways to persuade policymakers, decision makers, community members, et cetera, about trying new approaches to solving social problems. And um, this is, was an example to me of how artists and lawyers or policymakers can really put their heads together to try to 
tell a story that can have some measure of impact on members of the community, which was our hope here. And I guess to that end, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that it was very important to us to in some way um, address at an age appropriate level, the complicated racial landscape of suffrage. Um, and of course, even after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, not all women had equal access to the vote. And so we reference that in the book. Um, there are a diversity of women represented in the book, and that was very intentional. And these are hard things to know how to talk about to children, and our hope is that this can be a starting point for that conversation as well, um, even if it is an imperfect one. Well, let me ask about apathy for a moment, um, because it seems as though we have had tremendous reason over, oh, I don't know, let's say the last three and a half years. Uh, we've had a lot of opportunities. Just pick, <laughs> just pick a number out of the hat. It seems like uh, 30, but that's okay, Joe. Yeah, a reason uh, to go out into the streets, um, women, men, everybody kids, everybody, go out and, uh, and take the pots and pans and go out to the street. Well, why, why do you think that that is, I mean, there certainly have been examples. I mean, the Women's March immediately following uh, the election was one example. Uh, and it's probably the largest example uh, with the runner up being the, the um, guns, uh, the uh, march uh, after the shooting in, um, in Florida at, uh, Marjorie Stoneham Douglas, I think well, there's three words there, and I, I think I have them in the right order. Uh, but but so at what point do you think, oh, we should do this more? Like, what does it take to ignite us to take to the streets? Gosh, if I ha had the answer to that, I think I'd probably be out in the streets right now. It's In some ways, it's a really exciting time to think about that question, because we are seeing communities connect in ways that we've never seen before, even at a time when we are, uh, as a matter of, of public health, being kept apart. And so I think it'll be fascinating to see how um, young people in particular start to respond to the constraints of not being able to be in the physical public square, but still um, voicing opposition, still making sure that they are heard. And uh, I really do think that the potential is tremendous for impact. Um, and maybe there are forums outside of, say, Twitter, um, but that can be more collaborative, that can make sure that more voices get heard, can encourage reasoned discourse, um, artistic engagement, um, it, beyond the, um, the kind of back and forth quipping that happens on some platforms. So I think it'll be exciting to see how that evolves in this landscape. I also wanted to ask, I, I like the uh, fact that you are donating proceeds to an organization that uh, fights against voter suppression, um, enhances and encourages minority uh, voting, women of color, a fair fight. I believe it's Stacey Abrams organization. Can you talk about how you connected to that group and, and why you're supporting that with this book? They are doing remarkable work going state by state to ensure that people have the information that they need to get to the polls and then to ensure that the votes get counted after they are cast. Uh, I think that she is, has been a really inspiring voice of this generation and hopefully will continue to be just that. It seemed um, totally clear to us that given the incredible importance of the 2020 election, that any small bit we could do to try to support those efforts was an opportunity that we couldn't miss. So mm -hmm. it, it was, as, as we say in the Jewish faith, it was sort of besher, I think, that it is the centennial of suffrage. And we had written this book, and Stacey Abrams is just leveraging people nationally around this vital issue at a time when really the, uh, the nation's future is at stake. Great. I also wanted to mention, this is part of this collaboration between WAMC Northeast Public Radio and the New York State Writers Institute to help our independent bookstores, which are really struggling during the pandemic. And in particular, 
This book uh, will be available at I Love Books, a lovely little independent bookshop in Del Mar. And uh, I know you'll be going out of your way to make sure uh, Melissa Steen, who runs that bookstore, will have books. And we hope people will, will get them from their local independent bookstore as well. Please do. Thank you to I Love Books and thank you to all of the independent booksellers out there who are um, fighting hard to make sure that people still have access to all kinds of books. This was a real journey for us and um, at times a challenging one, but we ultimately made the decision to work with a self-publisher and um, although we learned a lot in the process, it really does go to the incredible um, potential for small businesses, um, small authors, uh, small bookstores to connect with each other and to try to tell stories. And that at its core, I think is, is who we want to be as an author and illustrator or people who bring people together. So thank you to all the small bookstores out there and to uh, both of your organizations for highlighting this work. Great. Joe, anything else? Well, people can find out more information on a very cool website. It's marchonny.com, marchonny.com. And you can find out more information and the resource guide and information about the two of you and the resource guide, as well as some really cool information about the book itself is available on that website. So all good stuff. Thank you very much. It's a beautiful book. It supports important causes and it's a, a really vital lesson for uh, young readers and, and particularly mothers to share and, and read to their young children, I think. Thank you so much. <laughs> James, thank you so much. My God. I want to get some rhymes on that. Come great. on, give us some rhyme. <laughs> yes. um, we would love for your listeners to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Lucy Lang NYC and at Bruce Lang. Um, feel free to check out our website and support Fair Fight 2020. It has never been more important. Thank you to all the readers out there and thank you both for having thank us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lucy and Grace. Yeah. Be well. Thank, thank you. you.